Hello, everyone. And uh, my name is Pramod Sadalge. And today I'll be talking about evolutionary database design and architecture. And I'm based out of Chicago. So it's late night for me here, but hopefully you're in a good place and ready to listen to this. Uh, and I work for ThoughtWorks uh, and I've written some books as they are shown here. But the idea being, uh, I wanna talk about uh, the concept of evolutionary design. So the first question that generally comes up is uh, why evolutionary? Why do you even care about being evolutionary, right? So we know the reality is uh, businesses are in a constant change, especially true now, like maybe 30, 40 years ago, the business model and the types of business processes change like maybe once in a decade, much more slower change. But now businesses are changing much more faster, like two, three years, stuff has to change. You know, innovations much has to be at a much higher rate. And that innovation in turn force, forces your architecture and which in turn forces your database to change, right? So that's one of the reasons. Uh, the priorities are also constantly changing. Again, businesses are reacting to forces in the market and those forces are also doing you uh, or forcing the business to change, which in turn changes the priorities and also changes uh, the uh, the underlying databases and things like that, right? Uh, the other is also learning and responding to customer needs is critical nowadays. Like you can't just say, I'll, I'll come back with a feature in a year or so. You have to put a feature out, gauge some uh, response from the customer and see how it goes and then respond to that feedback that is coming in and you are learning from the feedback and that becomes critical, right? And at the same time, uh, we cannot have the luxury of like having a design phase where we are like uh, just sitting in a box somewhere and doing design. But nowadays design has become like a, uh, a continuous phase, right? Which where it evolves uh, based on feedback, evolves based on changing priority and all those things. And sometimes making decisions before they are necessary is a waste. Like you may think I want I want this design, I want these features, I want all of that stuff. And the market goes somewhere else. And then all that work you did is uh, basically a waste. And then you don't want to get into that situation. That's why this evolutionary thing has caught on and people are trying to do that. Mm. Evolutionary design on everything, right? So as product requirements evolve, so does the code as well as the database that supports that code. Uh, supports the business requirements needs to evolve, right? And the underlying thing of all of this is dealing with emerging design. As design emerges, how do you deal with that particular uh, change in the need itself, right? So the question comes in, how do you evolve databases as all of these business things are happening, right? And there's a classic definition I want to go back to that was done by Martin Fowler way back, uh, like maybe early 1999 where he said refactoring is a small change to your source code that improves its design without changing its semantics. Like without changing its behavior, it's improving the design of this thing. And to do database refactoring, I basically want to add one other factor to this, right? Like a database refactoring, again, is a small change to your database schema, DDL data, DB code, whatever it is, which improves its design without changing in semantics. But when it comes to database refactoring, there's a interesting thing that is different than code refactoring. In code refactoring, you're only created, only um, responsible for keeping the behavioral semantics uh, at the same. But in database refactoring, you also have to deal with the informational semantics. An example of that would be like in code refactoring, you can, you can change the name of the method, you can change the things that happens inside the method as long as the method does what it's supposed to do. But in databases, you can rename the table and all that stuff, but you cannot lose the information. Like if it's a customer table, you cannot lose the customer's names and addresses and things like that. So that's the informational semantics. So both of them have to be maintained for the information uh, and the refactoring to work. So a little bit of difference as compared to code refactoring that you have to keep in mind when you are doing a database refactoring. So let's talk why it is hard, right? So database refactoring is really hard because over the period of time, we have kind of like stitched our architecture around that database, right? So sometimes you are working with the database, 
your application, maybe your framework, maybe your e-commerce platform is working with the database. But over a period of time, <clears throat> a lot of like uh, other applications that you know about, there are sometimes applications you don't even know about, like someone in the op side has just given somebody a username password and they started like reading from your database. There are other places or uh, jobs that are putting data in your databases and there are other databases that are replicating from your database. Lots of dependencies happening. Uh, this kind of uh, pattern uh, is also known as database-based integration, right? Like kind of talked about in uh, Gregor Hoppe's book, uh, Enterprise Application Integration Patterns. And he talks about how like integrating at this level couples your architecture to the database, right? So generally what that does is once this coupling is tight, it's really hard to break it apart. And not just breaking, it's even hard to change what's inside your database. You, you don't even want to break, you just want to make it better. You want to like add more features. You want to probably uh, do some changes into the database, but it becomes really difficult because all the other constituents in your enterprise are gonna stop you from making that change because they are dependent on the database as it is. So then your architecture becomes really brittle, right? So over like the next five or 10 slides, I wanna explain how you can do your changes without trying to break or without breaking any of these applications. Of course, over a period of time, you want to evolve those other applications also to use the new design that you have put in place. And that gives you like a, this evolutionary way of doing changes in a database, right? So let's talk about those uh, types of changes. So generally speaking, there are like four types of changes or refactorings, and they are structural, they could be data quality related, they could be architectural, or they could be method kind of refactoring. Transformations are changes that you do to a database that are not necessarily a refactoring, but you are adding new things uh, to the database, right? So that's like, that's why we call it a transformation. And the way to do this is basically applying the strangler pattern to the database. A strangler pattern as defined by uh, Martin Fowler and I think even uh, some other people who are involved in that pattern is basically over a period of time, you want to take away some of the functionality from the old legacy code to the new code. And it could be anything, right? So it could, you, you may wanna go from a, a class or a web app that was defined and go somewhere else. You may want to break apart a, a monolith into microservices, or you may want to break apart a database. All of those are a kind of a strangler pattern, right? Applied to different areas of in your architecture. So we are applying a strangler pattern to the database also. And in the beginning, which is during the start, you are implementing the re refactoring, and I call it the expand phase when you're expanding this, uh, your database or expanding the refactoring. Then you have this uh, thing known as a transition period when the old uh, design as well as the new design both are working at the same time, right? So imagine you had like a deprecated class, your deprecated class is also working and your normal class is also working. So you have like these two types of uh, things going in parallel at the same time. And at some point of time, you deprecate, like uh, literally delete the old side and what's left is the new side or the new thing, right? So if you had like two objects, uh, definitions of objects or uh, definitions of views, for example, let's say, and you deleted the old view and now what's left is the new view. So you are now uh, totally deprecated the old one and uh, people have to use a new version of whatever you have come up with, right? So that's the way to do this. So let's kind of like uh, talk about an example here, right? So I have this uh, table called customer has three different columns. And you think like, oh, putting like nowadays people are all over the place. Nobody is like within their own region, mobile phones go move from state to state and that kind of stuff. So I just want to merge all the phone, three phone number related columns all into one because theoretically I just want all of them in one place, right? So that's what you do. You say, okay, I'm going to introduce a new column here, move all the data and that kind of stuff. And then basically like at the end, what's left is a phone number and a country code, right? So you could also talk like one other, one other example here is I have a first name and a last name and I basically want to convert, like make one of those columns non-nullable. Even that's a refactoring. You're trying to improve quality 
of the data by saying, at least the first name should be not null. You don't want a customer that doesn't have a first name or a last name in your database. So like you're saying, I want to improve the quality of this by adding certain things, right? Similarly, quality wise, there's also this, oh, I want to add a foreign key constraint. Like the account status has to be there on account. You cannot have account without account status. So I'm going to add a foreign key to that. That's also a quality based constraint that you can do. And here's an example of like a architectural constraint, um, refactoring that you can do. Like there's a customer, there's account and there's insurance. And you're constantly looking up, like joining all three of those tables to get this customer portfolio, right? Like a customer, the name and all their uh, like totals of insurance and totals of payments and that kind of stuff. You basically create like a, uh, read only copy, like maybe a view, or maybe you do a materialized view, like a table that gets populated in at some particular frequency. And it's only basically read only. But what you are doing is creating an interface for your data so that other people can just read your data without having to know the dependent tables where all this came from. And that allows you to improve read performance. But the trade-off now is there some data may be stale. And that's the architectural concerns that you should be dealing with, like, is this okay for the business to deal with? Like, if data is stale by, like, say, five minutes, two minutes, what is that interval? Do they really need it real time? Those are the types of concerns you're dealing with here. But here, if you introduce this kind of stuff, uh, this kind of uh, refactoring, what you are doing is giving people an ability to abstract away from the physical tables and that kind of stuff, which you can change at your own rate, as long as you keep the customer portfolio view or even materialized view consistent with what they're expecting, right? So it gives you abstraction layer that you can work with. The other uh, migrate method from database is basically removing code that was in the database, like say a stored procedure, for example, and you want to take it away from there and put it in one of your components or maybe a service or something. And the reason to do that would maybe is you want to have some horizontal scalability, maybe that get valid policies procedure. Uh, you want it now to call some rating service. You want it to call some policy validity service or something else that is that cannot be called from the database. So that stored procedure is cannot do what it's what you want it to do. So you are saying, okay, let me extract it out of the database. So in the before version, you have the stored procedure inside the database, but in the transition, you have it on both sides, right? Like same to, it's the exact functionality, but it's replicated on both sides, allowing the coding and e-service to also use that short procedure. But over the period of time, you basically extract it out. And now coding and e-service can also call the policy administration to get a list of valid policies instead of calling the get valid policy stored procedure in the database, right? So this way, architecturally, over a period of time, you can move some dependencies or coupling that's happening to the database to a different place, allowing you to move components around, do some kind of vertical scaling or horizontal scaling or any other type of needs you may have. And then at this point, I want you to like walk through an expand and contract example, like in a very detailed way so that we can see what options are available, how you can actually use it and things like that. So we are going back to this customer as an example here. So we have a customer and a name and you are thinking, okay, maybe I should like change this first name, last name, right? And you are not like thinking this just because you want to do this refactoring, but sometimes there are business needs that come in and they say, oh, I want to split the customers into first name and last name so that I can do some sorting, some other stuff uh, and keep track of like, for better master data management and things like that. And that's why this split usually happens. So in the beginning, uh, let's assume we have in the name column, we have the name of Pramod Sadalge, like my name. And then you say, okay, I'm gonna split this up. And then at this, in the expand stage, I still have a name column, which has the data of Pramod Sadalge. And the first name now becomes Pramod, last name becomes Sadalge. And when it contracts, right? Like when you are done and all the other dependencies on this particular table have caught up, not just your application, but all the other dependencies have caught up and probably they're ready to now release. 
you can just say now in the contract phase, I want to say first name is Pramod, last name is Sadalge, and there is no more the name column, right? At this point, you're done with the refactoring totally, and you are there with the new uh, two columns that are available, first name and last name, and there is no longer a column name name. Now, I'll walk this a little bit more further detail with you to talk about how this can be done, right? Like, so you have in the start, you have the name equal to Pramod Sadalge, and then you have two options to actually do this, right? Like one is without data migration. So you just introduce two columns to this, first name, last name. And there's another option is with data migration. And both of these options have like, uh, there's a place where you can both use both of them. Like, let's say you are not in production yet. Maybe you are even in only in QA and stuff like that. You say, okay, I'll introduce these two new names and delete the old name and we are all good. From now on, whatever new data I create, it will all use the first name and last name. But what about applications that are already in production, right? You can't put two columns there and have all of them be nulls, right? So you have to have some kind of like mechanism to move the data. That is the with data migration step that comes in, right? So in the simple scenario, all we are saying is you're basically modifying the customer table, adding a first name and last name, and you're done, right? Like nothing else to do. But a little bit more complicated scenario would be, you are adding those two columns and you are also adding a trigger which will basically synchronize. Like if, the, if some other application comes in and puts data into the old column, the old name column, you want to make sure you can split it and basically put the name part of that column into the first name and the last name part of that column into the last name column. And if some new application is actually coming in and writing the first name and last name, then you want to make sure you merge them together and put them in the name column. And the reason to do this is any old application looking for data that was written by the new application, right, that understands the first and new, will still get the data, right? And at the same time, if some new data was put in by the old application, the new application that you have modified can still get the data. So there's no data lag as such or there's no mismatches like saying, oh, your name was changed to that other application. Uh, you have to do it again here. So that kind of stuff just goes away and you have like all of that data synchronized, right? So that's why I call this a synchronized data scenario. Then we ca you can get a little bit more fancy here where you are migrating the data and um, synchronizing. Like, so we, we add the columns, we update the existing data, and then we put a synchronized thing in place so that we have taken care of existing data, we take care of future data that is integrated, that is being written by the old as well as the new columns, and all of that data is all in one place, right? So this is the expand stage and the transition stage when both old and new are in play, and your old and new applications are using their own version of the schema, right? So at some point in the future, uh, especially in a very complicated uh, enterprise archi architecture, this may take maybe a year or two years for everything to roll up and make things better. Uh, in a not so complicated architecture, you can say, oh, we are like in a month or two months, we are all caught up, we can just drop this column name and we are all happy, right? In like e-commerce or maybe 24 seven type of setups, the drop itself may take longer than necessary, right? So you may end up into like lock table situations and things like that. Lots of databases support this, like uh, set the unused, uh, like set this unused as a name column. So it doesn't show up anywhere, but it's still there. Like you have not actually taken it out, but it's still there, but not visible to anyone, right? So that that's one other method to like not, Take any downtime, but at the same time have some kind of a, uh, a method to contract, right? There's sometimes still somebody may else may come and say, hey, I was using the name column to extract my data out of this database and send it to like some external party. And now you have taken out my name column and I'm left with this first name and last name can you just uh, put the name column back, right? So there's usually like some of these laggard applications that cannot be actually modified. Maybe you don't even have the source code to modify and things like that. So those kinds of uh, requests do come about. 
So what do you do about those, right? Like, so you could also add like virtual columns like this, like in Oracle, in MySQL, it's called generated column and other databases also support this concept of, a, of generating a virtual column. And I call this creating a facade in the database, right? And it, like, it's not necessarily uh, true only in a column name. Like, let's say you modify the table name, you can add a view that match the old table name to create like a facade on the old table. You can do the same thing like using different methods of like giving a facade to the data so that whichever application is coming for data into your database looking for this stuff, you can create a, a facade or an interface for them uh, so that they can get, still get access to the data that they are looking for without having, without restraining you from doing the modification that you want to do, right? So that's that's the important bit to understand here. Is you are providing an interface for uh, consumers that can't really modify themselves, but at the same time, you are modifying your design, you are improving your design and delivering value back to the business without having to uh, stop yourself. It gets a little bit more complicated because you have to manage this uh, dual interface or dual facades, but at the same time, it does let you move forward with the refactoring that you are looking for, right? So here's the example I was talking about, like creating a view, like uh, there's a table called cust order and you think, oh, this table name doesn't really reflect what it is, like using the domain driven design concepts. So I'm gonna make it like a proper table name, but there may be some people who are still coming and looking at cust order and you say, okay, I'll just create a view for that and people can be happy using the view and I'm gonna use this customer order table so that I can start putting data in it and that kind of stuff. Over a period of time, you can ask those consumers to use the customer order table instead of the cust order view. And then you can just delete the view after some time when uh, you are contract, when in the contract phase, right? So one other thing you want to also keep track of is the more interfaces and the more facades you create over a period of time, you wanna make sure you clean them up or else you'll end up in like uh, a situation where there are so many facets, you'll kind of get confused in what is a facade, what is the interface, and what is the actual real stuff behind it, right? So keep track of what you need to clean up as you go so that you end up in a place where it's much more cleaner design-wise so that uh, you, can, you can be more productive in using that design, right? So let's talk about some things that actually enable you to do refactoring properly, right? So one is this keeping the old and the new working. It basically improves uptime and the ability to evolve. And it also gives you the facility uh, to take on things that otherwise would not have been allowed in an enterprise. Like, hey, that thing is not allowed. Don't touch that table. If 10 of those things happen, you can't do much in the database. And then we start creating, like when people don't allow you to modify a database, then what we start doing is we start creating side tables that basically have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with these things. And that over a period of time, that design gets so complicated, it doesn't perform, it doesn't scale and all that stuff kinds of things happen. So the ability to modify an existing database is important, right? So you improve the uptime as well as the ability to evolve itself. You should be in a position to create interfaces in the database, right? And many a times these interfaces are good to like support some applications that don't uh, necessarily deploy new changes at all. Like there are many, uh, in many companies, there are lots of these tools and interfaces or maybe even like libraries that cannot be modified because nobody has the source code and this thing is running for a long time and then we can't do anything about it. So for that kind of stuff, you should be able to create interfaces in the databases. And your databases should be able to handle multiple versions of the application. Right? And there, especially this is true when you're doing like uh, red green deployments or canary deployments as they're called. Uh, you may also want to do like hot cold kind of like environments where like you're deploying the new code in one place and the old code is available. If something goes wrong, you want to switch over and that kind of stuff, failovers. So, you're, so in those kinds of situations, especially like handling old and new for by the database should be like very easy for the application to switch from version to version without having to worry about if the database needs to roll back and that kind of stuff. And again, like wrapping tables into views to provide a facade is a very good way of allowing older applications to uh, 
perform similar to like calculated columns to perform to give you a facade using triggers to synchronize data between like tables that are split or columns that are split or merged and things like that. And we can think about this, this way of thinking about just like when you're deprecating an API or a method, right? Like the old as well as the new, both are available at the same time. And over a period of time, you are deprecating the old permanently, like you can't even access that anymore. And you are providing a new interface that is going to be there forever, right? So you can think, have the same kind of philosophy even for, uh, even inside the database, right? Like it doesn't necessarily have to just at the code level, it can be inside the database also. And then what is this, what kind of guide is there to do a successful refactoring, right? So generally large refactorings are risky, like don't take on too much. And it's the same advice as code, like if you're code refactoring code, Generally, the advice is don't refactor too much. Like it should probably be done in a day, two days. Don't be in a place where like you're refactoring for months. And then when you try to go back and merge into the main line, it's really hard uh, because by that time, the main line has changed into many different things. Sequencing small refactoring so that you can create that large desired change that you want is a good way to go about these refactorings. Every refactoring should be like in version control, should be like, the same script that runs in like dev or CI or QA, UAT, prod, performance, whatever environments, it with the same migration script that the developer wrote or the DBA wrote in the beginning. And generally I advocate that developers and DBAs pair together to create this change, right? So when that happens, that same change can then move on to different environments, right? And even if you have changes for data, like your reference data changes, for example, or if someone introduced a bug and then the uh, fix to that bug is basically fix the data, then that also can be just a migration that gets introduced into your pipeline, right? And they should be treated just like any other code. So you can like basically uh, check them in when the CI engine runs, it uses the same migration script, it packages those migration scripts, it ships the migration scripts along with the uh, artifacts. So all of that, uh, should be just like you treat code. And the, even those these migrations should be in the same place where uh, your CI scripts are, right? Like your all of your code base is. Basically, that's where they need to be. So let's look at like a journey of like evolutionary design, right? Here are like my 10 of my stories or uh, requirements or Jira tickets or whatever you want to call it. Like, so look up a car by a vehicle identification number. You want to see the accidents reported against the car. You want to look up a truck also now. You want to see the cars, truck, make, model, whatever. You want to look up owners for a car. Then when the car was first sold, so you want to get a little bit of history and you want to look up what type of vehicle it was. You want to see the uh, mileage reading or kilometer reading on it. And you want to see how the vehicle was used and you want to get a history of owners of this vehicle. So those are the sequence in which you are getting stories or tasks. And let's see a journey of how the tables we evolve over time. Like the first time when you get this uh, story, you're just say, creating a table for a car and uh, basically a owner and that kind of stuff. And then you create a foreign key, then you add an accident table because you want to see a list of accidents against a car. Then you are basically adding a unique index on a win because the vehicle identification numbers are unique, right? And then you go, okay, let me make it easy on searching, add an index on the last name. And then you start putting some other stuff because that's what is being looked at. And then at some time you were basically changing the table uh, car to be called a vehicle now. You don't want a car table and a truck table. So you basically call it a vehicle table. And then you add a vehicle type, like is it a car or a truck or a tractor or anything else? So you basically add that kind of stuff. And you also add like a bunch of data to the vehicle type in the drop down if it's showing up in the drop down kind of thing. And then you basically remove the owner column from the car table and basically add a join table that joins the owner and vehicle because it, now you are going into the feature where you have multiple owner over a period of time and that kind of features are being added. Then where is this car right now that you created? A <coughs> you are basically creating a, a view for that table, right? 
and then you are saying okay let me uh, basically add more columns to the owner table that's what's happening here and then you basically create an owner type is it a company is it a private owner and things like that now get added and then what happens is you're basically trying to like in the bottom you see here if there are accidents you want to basically create like you renamed it to event and what was the event type was it accident was it like flooded was it any other type of like uh, um, incident that you want to record against the car so you're calling it the event now and you introduce the concept of an event type so all of this is happening and then when this is happening all of these changes are like a series of requirement changes that happen to the database schema right and you are being these changes were not like you just decided you want to do they are being dictated by the changing requirements as the requirements come to you that's how you are designing right because at any point of time the business may say okay we are ready to uh, release to production right so your code has to be and your database at the same time has to be ready to go to production at any point of time and that uh, series of changes are basically nothing but migrations those series of changes are nothing but migration and as we saw before every change is a migration and we saw how to write a migration before so that we can basically take a list of uh, these migrations and we have those all ready to go right but without good development practices and patterns using and implementing evolutionary design is difficult right so what are those practices that make like any like even in code side if you want to do tdd and all of these there are all practices that support evolutionary design and similarly even in the database uh, evolutionary design is supported by some good practices right like test the behavior of the database for example like objects in code uh, databases also have behavior so you can develop some tests ar uh, around that behavior so i'll just show you an example here's an example of that says like okay you should not do save uh, duplicate win cars yeah, i don't want to save any model years that are uh, 2010 or uh, uh, under so if, if i try to save a 2004 model it should fail like should not basically right you should not save when the model name is null for example and a bunch of that kind of uh, stuff like i don't want cars in here that are less than 12000 miles and that kind of stuff or more than 12000 miles 10000 miles so this table definition basically will make all those tests pass right so now the behavior in the database is encoded in a test and what this gives you the power to do is now you can say okay my definition or the function of my vehicle table i am expecting certain features from this table right oh it should not accept duplicate wins that's a requirement you are saying the vehicle table should support similarly you are saying a bunch of things like name cannot be null again that's a requirement you are putting on the vehicle table all of those can be exercised using a test a test that runs automatically in your ci cycle so that if someone changes this by mistake or someone changes this because there is a new requirement one of these tests will fail and that will create a conversation point uh, between the developer and the probably the analyst saying okay what why did we change this requirement previous requirement said this we are changing this is there a reason what is the reason that kind of stuff so it introduces that uh, conversation point which is very good to have because you don't want to change these requirements and not know what else is breaking right so imagine if you have this kind of test some other application may actually write a test on your side saying here's my test for your table because i'm using your table and if you change anything in the table their test will break and then that will be a conversation point between your team and their team saying okay i broke your test why are you how are you using this table and maybe tell them to like change their code base right and so these conversation points are really important right and then you can once you have those kinds of tests those kinds of migrations now you can put that migration stuff in a ci cycle right so when you're developing that's where you're writing the migration script that migration script using your build scripts uh, like rake or gradle or ms build or maven or whatever you have is running against your own local copy of the database right and then you can use basically like any kind of source control to basically check that in right that's what you're doing 
And when the source control uh, receives a new migration script, probably along with a bunch of other code that you changed, that's talking to the new structure of the database, then the CI server basically takes all of that as a package and runs it against the integration database. And when that happens, your migration scripts, your code, all of your tests, all of that run in a pristine environment and gets tested again. Uh, and then when those tests pass, you can just publish your migration scripts as well as code base as one package. And whenever that package gets deployed to your QA environment, your UAT or production or performance, whatever environment, it gets run again there. So the same script is running multiple times. So there is no question of will this script run? Will this application run against this version of the database and things like that? So you don't have to uh, you don't have to worry about those kinds of things, right? Uh, so that is like a way to run uh, a CI version of this database, uh, CI version against your database migration scripts, as well as your code all at the same time, right? And now th what this does is gives you a power to like maintain different versions of the database in different environments. You may want more than one QA environment. You may want more than one UAT, or maybe there's a demo environment. Maybe there's a client test environment, or maybe different pairs are working in different versions because somebody is probably fixing bugs into a production code base and somebody else is working on new features. Everybody gets different versions so that you can work independently of others, right? So that gives you that power to do that. And once you get into this kind of way of working, you can now easily deploy frequently, right? Because now you have a script that goes with the code base that can be just deployed at a click of a button and that allows you to deploy frequently. And deploying frequently basically reduces risk, right? So I, I show this boat metaphor for a reason is, imagine you have this boat going from one shore to the other shore and this boat goes only once in six months then everybody who wants to get from this shore to that shore is gonna pile onto that boat, right? And that introduces all kinds of risks. Uh, one is over like burdening the boat, the weight and all that stuff. But at the same time, if you don't get onto that boat and the next boat is in six months, the fear of waiting for six more months will make business users pile on a bunch of features on you all to be done, even if they are not a priority and that kind of stuff. So it creates interesting human dynamics that forces you to like, even if they don't want it right now, they'll ask, I want it right now because I don't know when I'll get in the next boat ride, right? So that's why it creates interesting dynamics on the business side. So if you say, I'm gonna release, I'm gonna deploy every Thursday, for example, then the business may be even more relaxed. Like if I miss this Thursday, I'll get the next Thursday's boat. And you can make it more interesting by saying I can deploy every day to production that again makes it more interesting to the business saying, oh, we are deploying every day. So they are much more relaxed about not pushing things on the dev team to like uh, release to uh, into the release every six months and then so. So especially deploying frequently, uh, it's counterintuitive a little bit, uh, but deploying frequently actually reduces risk. I have a question here from Rakesh Pai, and he's asking like, how would you add a unique constraint on a win at a later point in time, if constraint didn't exist before, and there is possibility of duplicate data in the column, right? So when this happens, what you want to do first is find all the duplicate wins in the data first as an analysis point, and then ask the business, what do you want to do about this, right? So the business may say, oh, these are all duplicate wins, and uh, they are the same car that have different owners. And then you can say, oh, I can just move the wins that are duplicate as different owners on the same car and then merge those rows, then it becomes just a pure data migration. You do that data migration and then add the unique constraint. Sometimes the business may say, oh, the duplicate wins, but they are different owners. I want to represent as different uh, cars totally. Then you have to come up with a scheme where you introduce like probably the owner ID also into the uniqueness uh, concept and make the owner plus the win as unique at that particular uh, point of time. So the answer here probably has to come from what it needs to be done from the business. And then you can you have then various paths to implement that particular refactoring. Because if the business says, oh, all the duplicate wins are really duplicates, they're just different owners at different point of time, 
then you basically collapse them and add create more rows on the owner side and then uh, you have this one to many going uh, between owners and uh, like cars and owners and then you can just add the constraint afterwards if the business says no they are really like different cars i just want to represent them as that then you have to bring in probably the owner into the uniqueness i have another uh, question here from pradeep chandran is there a way the DB can recognize which are the applications interfaces the, that access DB similar to any application that can track and know where they are other applications interfaces that are interacting? So on the database side, you can add some system triggers that can tell you what tables or who is logging in and uh, who is accessing tables and things. That information is there, but it's not really um, I would say that granular for you to go back to the, because many a times, a lot of uh, applications are probably sharing the same username password, which is a bad practice, but sometimes happens. Uh, similarly, like a lot of uh, places also share, uh, like they have shared access. They have this common username that everyone uses. Uh, you, though that kind of stuff, you can't really figure out, but there are system level triggers that you can put in that can tell you who logged in, what time it was logged in, what table was created, uh, like mm, DDL created and that kind of stuff. The thing that you cannot put a trigger against is select statements. And that's one of the biggest drawbacks of trying to track this at the database level is that uh, the select statements cannot really be tracked. There are techniques to do that also, uh, only if you had followed this from before, like for example, you can create two schemas. One schema actually has the tables and the other schema is basically a wrapper, including like just views around these tables. And within those views, then you can have like probably a sequence or something. And that only, the only thing it can do is basically increment the sequence and tell you, okay, this table was read and that's about it. It cannot really tell you who read it. And the reason for that is that level, granular level uh, information cannot be extracted out of the database level stuff. So generally to solve this kind of problem, what I tend to do is basically work at the ORM layer of these things and talk about like, okay, how can I add this kind of functionality at the ORM layer? Of course, this does not solve the problem of other applications coming to your database and trying to get stuff out of there. The way to fix that also is sometimes especially in QA and UAT environments, don't try to do this in production environments, is to see what all connections are coming in. And probably sometimes you can change the IP address of the server, or you can change the password of the server and see what fails. That's a good way to figure out who else is calling a database in a, in a fast minute, um, but not recommended for production environments. Uh, all right, on to the next slide. That's all I had to say. Hopefully uh, you got something and I think I'm right on cue here. Yes, yeah, so Pradeep is saying challenge is the third party applications. So again, the code base on which you have no control, if they're calling your database directly, then you are anyway in a pickle because you can't change your database without the third party application, third party uh, people changing their application and that kind of stuff. So that's why like database-based integration is really tough and it's considered a bad practice uh, in the new microservices uh, landscape because database-based integration kind of couples your database to the architecture and over a period of time, it's hard to like break it apart. It makes your architecture very brittle. So generally avoid it. And if any third-party applications need data from your database, uh, best recommendation is to ask them to come via service and you can evolve the service over a period of time. And so they don't have access to direct access to your database. That's all I had. Thank you, folks.